Well, equities rallied for the third straight week last week with new all-time highs being printed across the board on Wall Street as the Goldilocks U.S. economic outlook persists, helping the dollar to rally for a fourth straight week against a basket of peers, with the G10FX market largely shrugging off decisions from, among others, the ECB, the Bank of Japan and the Bank of Canada. A huge calendar awaits this week. It really is a monster one for the financial markets coming up over the next four or five days. We've got the first Fed and BOE decisions of 2024, plus the U.S. Treasury's quarterly refunding announcement, five of the magnificent seven reporting earnings, along with about 40 percent of the S&P 500 by market cap. And of course, we've got a busy data docket as well, with January's U.S. labor market report rounding out the week on Friday afternoon. Plenty for us to get our teeth into here on the Trade Off UK this week. So without further ado, let's get into the show. So if it felt busy last week, I think that's going to pale into insignificance compared to what we've got coming up over the next four trading days. It really is a blockbuster week for the financial markets. And joining me, as always, to try and make sense of what is coming up over that period is Ryan Littlestone from Forex Flow Live and Forex Analytics. And Ryan, a very good afternoon to you. We're filming this on, on Monday afternoon as normal. And uh, it feels like the calm before the proverbial <laughs> storm today, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely going to need our wits about us this week. Tons of data, central banks, everything going on this week. So, uh, yes, yeah, it should be a fun week. Hopefully, uh, a profitable week for uh, for me, particularly, and uh, particularly all your traders as well at uh, over there at Pepperstone. So, yeah, you know, I wish everyone well this week. Of course, I uh, echo those sentiments. I think long vol, short sleep and long caffeine <laughs> are the positions that we all need going into this week. Uh, but why don't we get into topical thunder and uh, work out what's likely to be taking place? So it's one of those weeks where I think we both probably struggled to get this down to four topics. We could have had 40 topics and uh, still wouldn't have been able to fit everything in. Uh, but I want to start with the central bank decisions that we've got coming up. Obviously, it was a busy week for monetary policy last week. The Bank of Japan keeping all policy settings unchanged and not really offering any pushback on the idea that they are going to begin to tighten policy this year. Similarly, the ECB, pretty much a copy and paste from what they did in December. No real explicit pushback from from Lagarde and Co. on the idea uh, of rate cuts before the summer, although there are some cracks emerging in the governing council, judging by uh, the speakers we've had this week, Villaroy, Centino, for example, talking about the fact that they could cut before the summer. But nevertheless, that is now in the past. I think the focus shifts this week firmly to the FOMC and then, of course, also just down the road from me on Threadneedle Street, the Bank of England as well. So to take those in turn, we're not expecting any rate changes from either the market not pricing any rate changes from either, in fact. Um, of course, with the Fed, the market is 50-50 at the moment, just looking at current pricing in terms of the first 25 basis point cuts coming in March. So I think the focus, therefore, for the Fed is going to fall on the policy statement. Do we see any significant changes or even subtle changes to that statement, implying that we are nearer to a rate cut um, than we have previously been expecting? Um, I think the the key thing to keep an eye on is the line, any additional policy firming. Is that tweaked in any way, shape or form to remove that tightening bias? And of course, we have Jay Powell speaking at the post-meeting press conference as well. Of course, the Fed loathed to declare premature victory over inflation, although it does look like a soft landing is on the cards and core PCE coming back below 2% if you annualised uh, over a three and six month basis, the, the monthly figures. But I think you've got to remember the, the two things here. One, one is the Fed was scarred by the whole transitory debacle. And two, I think the memories of that really dovish reaction to the December decision are still going to be fresh in the Fed chair's mind. So it's going to be interesting to see how hawkish Powell is on Wednesday. I think the balance of risks does probably tilt more hawkish, given the market pricing 140 basis points worth of cuts by year end. It's very, very tough to see the Fed doing anything to explicitly endorse that path. And then, of course, we've got the BOE about 18 hours after. And I think 
This is going to be an interesting one from the bank because the old lady's forward guidance has been unchanged since August. It's very much out of step with that of their G10 peers. They're still saying that they're prepared to hike again if inflation remains persistent. And they're still talking about this higher for longer policy stance, which leaves them as a little bit of an outlier. So I do think we're going to see some dovish revisions to that guidance. I think we're probably going to see uh, some downward revisions to the inflation forecast again to try and signal that uh, they are adopting a more cautious stance. And I think uh, the most hawkish will see a 9 nil vote for bank rate to remain unchanged at five and a quarter percent. But perhaps even Dingra, who hasn't voted for a hike since November of 2022, shifts her view to actually vote for a cut and dissent in, in a dovish direction at this meeting. So very, very interesting. I expect some fireworks from uh, both the Fed and the BOE this week. Uh, Ryan, what are your thoughts on uh, on those two? Yeah, I think you got it nailed on. It's not so much about policy, but what uh, is going to happen to policy down the line. Um, and as you say, taking out those or adding different bits of language just to just to give the market a little taste of, of what's to come for the thinking. For the Fed, I don't think there should be that much change. You know, we only got their, their forecasts uh, in December, so nothing's really changed apart from inflation, you know, being a bit more sticky. You know, we had the PC on Friday, which generally edged their way but uh cpi was was a bit more sticky so you know we're not really near target yet um three hikes are still on the table uh, as the medium from the cuts, fed and the cuts. dots the cut sorry cuts <laughs> still, still in that mode i'm still in hype mode um but yeah cuts are, uh you know three cuts are still expected the market still wants more so we've still got a bit of disparity there uh, so, yeah, I think it's all going to be about the language. Does Powell give a bit more of a pushback um, to what happened in December? Possibly. Um, the higher for longer needs to stay in place. Obviously, the talk about financial conditions as well needs to be uh, uh, looked at because they might say that, yes, financial conditions are still tight and that's doing half the job for them, which will be sound uh, as a bit of a dovish uh, slant as well. For the Bank of England, well, as we know, they like to... Uh, be dovish where they want to be, particularly <laughs> Bailey, and uh, he's got a good record of sinking the, the pound when he speaks, though not over the last few months. Uh, mm. He hasn't managed to do much uh, damage, so he's probably due one. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the votes are going to be very important uh, as to what happens. Is Are we going to start to see a shift of some two cuts uh, and more coming off the, the sidelines? But I think overall it's going to be a message unchanged from those guys. Inflation did come down a chunk in the last reading, but... We're still high. We've still got those high wages, you know, 6%, 6% plus, uh, which is going to be a way for those. I thought they might come down significantly um, over the last few months, but they, they've they still been sticky. So, yeah, I think it's uh, for, particularly for the BOE, they're going to keep the message in play. Um, I don't think they'll go too dovish just yet. Um, the economy picking up as well. So that would naturally bring some uh, possible inflation behind it. And that's <laughs> that's going to be their their worry from those guys. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a busy one. Uh, I, I don't know how we're going <laughs> to trade it uh, right now. It's going to be listen and watch and uh, react, I think. Yes, exactly that. And I think there's there's still that difference and that divergence that we spoke about last week between what the market thinks central banks should do and what central banks actually will do. And I think yeah. we, we saw that with the uh, the ECB, with the BOC last week. Um, and I think we're certainly going to see that uh, with the Fed and the BOE uh, this week as well. And of course, for those trading the Swedish krona, there is a Rick's Bank decision this week as well. But we really don't have time uh, to go into that. Uh, speaking of the ECB, though, uh, the Eurozone inflation figures this week, I think they're going to be pretty crucial for uh, policymakers over in Frankfurt, aren't they? Yeah, very much so. Part of the busy data calendar we've got this week, we get the, the first series of inflation data for January from the Eurozone. Um, pretty much all the Eurozone majors report uh, ahead of uh, the pan-Eurozone number on Thursday. Um, expectations for that are for the headline to come in unchanged at 2.9% and the core to fall back two pips to 3.2%. Uh, now, last month, there was a big jump. The headline went from 24 to 2.9%, uh, and then the core came down two pips. So, again, sticky, sticky, sticky. Are we going to see uh, a proper two-handle on these numbers coming closer to target for that headline number? Maybe the core starting to see a two-handle. As we know, the ECB, they do their accounting smoke at mirrors. The headline could come down to 2%, but if that core is still up at three, then they'll focus on the core number. Um, so these numbers will be a test for the ECB versus the market trade. Now the market has been scared away from March pricing as the first cut. Um, 
April is now the darling. Post ECB, money markets were, were pricing an 80% chance of a cut by April uh, versus 60% before um, the statement from Lagarde. It's also now fully pricing 50 basis points uh, by June, 50 basis points of cuts by June, which is still, as we just said, at odds with what nearly every ECB governor has said. So all this tug of war between central bank rhetoric and market pricing is what's going to keep uh, or what has been helping to keep euro dollar range bound and, and pretty much afloat, even in the face of the Fed giving the same sort of vibes uh, about their monetary policy and the data over there looking better than in Europe. So if these numbers offer a decent variation from expectations, look for the same old pattern we've seen in trading and in price moves recently, prices to hit key levels only to then perhaps revert back to a, a mid-range as we've seen. That's been the theme so far this year. I don't see any reason why that's a change, but that therein gives us the opportunities uh, to trade the key levels. Yes, exactly. I, I would firmly agree with that. And actually, just to touch on your point uh, about the April ECB meeting, I know you've been uh, away from the desk this morning, mate, but that's actually now fully priced uh, for a oh, 25 <laughs> basis point cut. So, uh, yeah, we, obviously those remarks from uh, Vilroy over the weekend saying that they can cut at any meeting uh, and then Centino, the Portuguese uh, central bank governor this morning, saying actually we should cut sooner rather than later um, <laughs> have clearly been sort of manna from heaven for the uh, ECB doves that are, are out in the market. Um, I think the inflation number is going to be absolutely key. It, it very much seems the view at the moment um, that we're going to get to March. That'll be when the ECB have got some Q1 wage data. They tweak their forecasts, they tweak their guidance, and then they cut um, in April. Um, I guess to throw it back to you, and this is a little bit mean because I appreciate you haven't seen the latest pricing, but the market sees 50-50 the Fed go in March. The market's fully pricing the ECB go in April. The market's fully pricing the BOE go in June. Who do you think goes first? Oof, I think they all go in June. That's that's wild. Uh, maybe not the, the BOE. The BOE is the out the out because, as you know, inflation's a different uh, animal over here in the UK. It's, it's always going to be far more sticky. Uh, it's going to present more problems because a lot of it is imported inflation. But in regards to the Fed and the ECB, Unless we see the data absolutely collapse, um, then I think June is going to be the earliest they both cut. So uh, what do you think, Michael? Is that uh, a I, bet we can have uh, on this one? <laughs> I think in an ideal world, they would all want to wait until June, uh, yeah. if not longer, because that would pretty much be a year of higher for longer and, and a year of restrictive policy. Um, I don't think the data is going to let the ECB wait until June. Um, inflation is rapidly coming back down towards target. The, the headline spike that we saw in December was pretty much all base effects due to some quirks with German energy prices. Um, we are rapidly seeing disinflation across Europe. And then when you look at the growth side of things, the, the PMI numbers that we had out last week were just grim, to be quite honest. Uh, you've got the German central bank governor running around going, oh, we're not the sick man of Europe. Well, look at the data, mate. You quite clearly are. And the rest of Europe is pretty sick as well. Um, so I think uh, things are probably going to head south pretty quickly, uh, particularly given that China is is showing no sign of picking up. Uh, you've got all these geopolitical issues in the, the Red Sea as well. That's going to hit the Eurozone pretty hard, you would imagine, more so than peers. Um, so yeah, I think April's probably about right for the first ECB cut, actually. The okay, others, I think, are away. That's, that sounds like uh, we've got a lunch on the cards again, doesn't it? Uh, it does, so but I'm choosing first. the venue this time. Uh, KFC <laughs> around the corner. Uh, right, moving on. <laughs> before before my wallet takes another beating. Uh, if you're picking if you're picking the venue, you're assuming you're going to lose again. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Right. Uh, the jobs report that is uh, coming up on Friday, of course, as if this week wasn't busy enough already. We get our latest read on the state of the U.S. labor market. Of course, this is January data. Headline non-farm payrolls expected to have risen by 180,000 on the month. That's a very modest cooling from the 216, 216 that we saw in the month of December. Uh, I've done a research this week, Ryan. You'll be pleased to know I've looked back at the data and four of the last five prints uh, have surprised to the upside in terms of that headline non-farm payrolls number. Um, 
Leading indicators are a bit mixed. I mean, the initial claims and continuing claims are, are very positive. The initial number at its lowest level since September of 2022 in the survey week. Um, but I think there's a few worries, actually, that uh, some of the cold weather that we saw during the survey week, it was a very frigid period in, uh, across most of the United States, um, and that could actually depress headline payrolls growth somewhat. Of course, one uh, you know slightly sub-consensus month is by no means a disaster. The US economy needs to add a about 120,000 jobs a month to keep up with population growth. Uh, but I think it, it, it would be a concern and it would obviously uh, show that the pace of jobs creation continues to, to cool a little bit in terms of the US labour market. Um, other areas of the jobs report, unemployment is, is expected to tick marginally higher to 3.8 from 3.7% previously. But importantly, if you look um, at the consensus estimates, participation is also set to tick higher to 62.6%. So if you get both of those moving higher, it's not actually that bad of a sign. It's a sign that people are coming back to look for work rather than more people are losing their jobs. So I think the, the policymakers would pretty much look through that. Uh, and in terms of earnings, we're expecting a pace of around three tenths of 1% on the month, 4.1% on the year. Um, it is a busy week of jobs data in the United States. We've got the Jolt's job openings numbers for December, they're due uh, Tuesday, so today by the time uh, you watch this. And we've also got the ISM manufacturing PMI on uh, Thursday, and we've got the usual challenger layoffs data and all that kind of stuff coming up as well. Um, but I think overall, Ryan, and, and I'm keen to get your view on this, I think we're still going to be waiting quite a while for the labour market to soften. It feels like we've been waiting about 18 months for this already. I think we, we're going to be waiting uh, a fair while longer. But what I would say is I think that on the payrolls numbers, when that drops, on Friday afternoon, I think there's probably a bigger chance of a market reaction or a more significant reaction on a beat than on a miss, given how dovishly the market is, is already priced in terms of the policy outlook. Um, although I would caveat that by saying, you know, depending on what Jay Powell says on Wednesday evening, we could be in a very, very different situation indeed. Yeah, th this month it can be a bit of a funny one. Obviously, you've got uh, a bit of seasonals in there with the, the December period, obviously being holiday hiring and all that. We have had some uh, odd weather related numbers. I, if, I, if I recall correctly, was it 2015? We got a negative uh, 80 something uh, that caught the market on the hop uh, by a surprise. And then we saw a quick reaction there. So, yeah, you know, there's there's certainly no real other indicators to say there's any problems in the jobs market. You know, even the PMIs uh, have been saying that jobs are, you know, still ticking along. As you say, the jobless claims number as well, not really going anywhere. So, for all intents and purposes, this should be a pretty, well, I should say, uh, boring number. Um, I think what we need to look for is those wages numbers as well. Uh, the participation rate will be important uh, for the unemployment, but those wages, you know, they were expected to come down, I think, last month to 39 They stayed up at 4 4.1%. So that's showing a little bit of stickiness as well. Uh, and if they start creeping up again, then that's going to bring in some hawkish pressure. Obviously, uh, the market thinking about inflation as well on that front. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about whether if it's a, if it's a beat, we get, you know, a, a bigger price move. We've had positive job numbers now for, you know, going on for, for years now. And if we get a negative one and it's a big negative one, it is going to catch the market on the wrong foot. Um, and we will see a, probably a bigger reaction there. If it beats, it has to be, you know, a, a, a bonanza number, like a 500K plus something like that. Um, but as we've seen the last couple of weeks, particularly this year, anytime there's good US data that we get a good dollar rally on, it gets smashed, uh, you know, pretty much within uh, 20, 30 minutes. And the market, mm. again, is reverting back to uh, where it was middle of the ranges. So it's always a big number. It's the biggest number of the month. Always used to be on the floor uh, when I was trading there. Most exciting number. And uh, does that mean we're actually going to get a guess from you before, two minutes before? Yep, 12 o'clock Friday number. afternoon, as always. <laughs> You've done all that research and you still can't come up with a number. It's disgraceful. Oh, the, I've disgraceful. got to fire the old model up first. Uh, anyway, before <laughs> Ryan uh, starts reminiscing about his days on the floor and we're here till you know half past nine at night recording this, uh, why don't we move on to your last topic? Uh, I don't you know. Your on on yeah, um, I might change the topic. Uh, you know, just uh, go with my old uh, in the old days stories. But uh, no, I'll let you off. Um, I'm going to talk about Q1 growth. Um, We've had all the earnings coming out, and as Michael mentioned, we've got a ton more to come. And so far, Q4 earnings have been pretty pretty okay in the US. Um, there's been some hits, there's been some misses, but by and large, uh, there's still good revenues, still good profits. 
Um, however, what's caught my ear is the amount of warnings about Q1 guidance. Um, much like when I spoke about the trend in job losses, I've been noticing, uh, you know, we noticed they're not too significant, but there's a, a definite trend there. The same might be said of these warnings. Some firms see a drop in revenues uh, and activity, not just in Q1, um, but in 2024 uh, in its entirety. But it's nothing too disastrous. Um Again, like I mentioned with the jobs, it's not really the numbers uh, that are important right now, but the trend. You know, when you see some big hitters like Tesla and Intel warning of a slowdown, say not just in the quarter, but for the rest of the year as a whole, then maybe we should start to be prepared to see some software activity coming along. Now, obviously, that's not a foregone conclusion that firms' revenues and profits are going to start tumbling. I'm not here to, to be a big doomsayer or anything like that. Um, and as we've seen from the PMIs, there's been a bit of a, a tepid improvement, a general improvement uh, in most of the sectors, uh, particularly in the US with those uh, PMIs we got last week. But I think it's a situation we still need to monitor as it all goes into the pot for judging central bank moves. So for now, the soft landing theme is well entrenched, but that doesn't mean there won't be some bumps along the way. And those bumps have a habit of changing those market central bank expectations, which then obviously give us the price moves to trade. So the saying forewarned is forearmed uh, and it's an important one for us traders. Yes, indeed. And I think I'm glad you, you've brought that up, actually, because, um, you know, a lot of the time people can not necessarily ignore earnings and corporate reports, but sort of not pay perhaps as much attention as we should. Um, and I think what we've heard from uh, Tesla and Intel and a few others is actually some quite useful comments in terms of the economic outlook that you can then extrapolate and help use as part of building a, a, a bigger picture um, as to what's going on. Um, and I think also it speaks to, for those equity traders out there, the importance of not just beating on the top and bottom line, which is what everyone always looks at, but actually guidance coming in strong as well. Because the old saying with earnings is you massage and then beat. And what that effectively means is you spend the weeks before your earnings report on the phone with all the analysts who monitor your stock, trying to you know quash expectations under promise, and then you over deliver when the earnings drop. Um, which is you know why you end up with I think I saw fact set put a thing out over the weekend saying that the five year average is that seventy seven percent of reports beat EPS expectations, <laughs> which you know basically says to me don't pay attention to them. there's literally no point in them. Um, what you should be looking at is the guidance and how does that compare to what they issued the previous quarter uh, and are they optimistic about the outlook not just if you're trading those names but also in terms of the broader macro landscape. Um, and then, of course, with those big tech earnings coming up this week, you're not only looking for EPS and revenues, you're looking for them to give some decent guidance as well. And that's when you'll start to see some, some real strength come through in those names if they can tick both of those boxes. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and this is where you can you can tie several things together. You know, as I said last week, I was talking about the job situation where we're just hearing some of the big tech firms, particularly, you know, losing 600 here, 700 there. Not big numbers, but if, if firms like Google, which they're reporting Alphabet reporting this week, you know, if they're cutting jobs, then maybe there's going to be something in their guidance that says, yeah, the reason we're cutting jobs is because we don't see growth in these areas or, mm. or we're expecting a, a fall in activity. So, those jobs numbers might be a little precursor to what we might get from some of these big earnings. So it, it all goes into the, the same pot and it can give us a, an early look at how things are going in the economy in general. Absolutely. And ultimately, what we're trying to do here is uh, everyone who's involved in the markets get as much information as you can, build up as clear a picture as you can in order to give yourself the most informed view possible of uh, not only what's going on, but what is also likely to happen. And, uh, you know, hopefully that's what we're doing with this show. Um, what we are going to do now, though, is uh, have a look at some charts. Right. Uh, Ryan seems to have some sort of infatuation with uh, the euro this week. So before we get on to that, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Uh, I want to talk about uh, crude. I I'm looking at, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> I'm actually looking at having a cough. Uh, what I'm looking at on the screen, though, uh, excuse me, is WTI, although it's a very similar chart if you look at Brent. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think the move that we saw on Thursday and Friday is interesting. Um, we've had a lot of supply risk bubbling away for a while now um, as the geopolitical situation has continued and escalated, uh, both obviously between uh, Israel and Gaza, but also in the Red Sea with the, the Houthi uh, rebels coming out of Yemen and, and all the rest of it. Um, it seems 
as if the market is actually starting to sit up and take a little bit more notice of this. Um, we had that attack on a Trafigura tanker in the Red Sea on Thursday, and that seems to have represented quite a marked escalation in the situation. And then, of course, over the weekend, you had this attack um, on a U.S. Army base in Jordan, where sadly some, some soldiers have, have lost their lives. And it seems like that the crude market is starting to price in a greater degree of geopolitical risk once more. Both Brent and WTI were up over 6% last week. WTI's uh, best week since September. And for the technicians out there, that took the front month future north of not only the top of the prior year-to-date range, which came in just north of $75 a barrel, but it also saw us close on Friday north of the 200-day moving average for the first time since mid-November of last year. And I think this sets things up pretty interestingly because on the one side, you've got supply risks that seem to be escalating. And on the other side, as we touched on earlier, you've got a demand outlook that still looks pretty dour. China is still in the doldrums and the manufacturing PMIs that we had out last week were far from stellar. So I think to the upside now, the key level to watch is this region between $79.75 and $80 a barrel. Not only is that obviously a huge psychological level, it's also where you've got the 100-day moving average. And it's also where you've got that double top and those two highs that we saw back in November. So if anyone is feeling brave and looking to lean against the move with a very, very small and well-managed position, that is probably the region to do it. It's something that I would perhaps be looking at given the way that supply-induced rallies have faded relatively quickly thus far. Uh, but that break north of the 200-day moving average, the technicians would say that gives the bulls control. And if we do see tensions continue to ratchet further, then maybe we are heading north of uh, $80. But I think as is always the case, and even more so than normal at the moment, um, not getting married to a view, remaining agile, remaining nimble uh, if trading crude is uh, is still the order of the day here. Yeah, I mean, we've all been a bit surprised that that uh, it's taken this long to, to start moving higher. Um, you know, this situation has, has been going on for a while now. Um, I think it's more a case that perhaps sellers and shorts are less uh, willing to come into and hitting the rallies because of this risk. There's not been a capitulation of, of shorts, otherwise we'd be up in the 80 buck mark uh, pretty quickly. So I think it's just people taking their foot off the gas regarding shorts and selling. The fundamental picture will eventually take over. Hopefully there's a quick re resolution to all, all this stuff going on. Yeah, um, when that happens, the sellers will probably come right back in and, and smash it all the way back down again. So yeah, it's not that buyers are, are steaming in and it's that the market's flipping. Um, I think there's a bit more caution. Uh, we do have those geopolitical risks. No one wants to be uh, heavily short and have a headline blow them up for, for two, three, four, five bucks. Um, so I think that's what we're, we're seeing at the moment. It, you, you've got to be careful if you're playing shorts, um, particularly into a weekend, because you don't want to wake up on a, on a Sunday night. There's been a big headline and uh, find that oil's gapped higher by a couple of bucks. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll see a bit of that going on as well, where you get a bit of profit taking. Anyone who's short into the weekend, you start to see a rally because they all, all exit their trades. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's it's a difficult one technically because, you know, uh, you know, geopolitics and, and wars and things like that don't give a, a stuff for technical analysis. So uh, you've got to be careful when, you, when you're using the text on this one. Use it as your normal guide, but uh, be wary of those headlines. Absolutely. Very well said. Uh, right. So you've asked here, what's next for the euro? Why don't you tell us what's next for the euro? Well, I was going to ask you what's next for the euro, and then I can just I put my feet up and say it myself. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we've spoken about the ECB, the data, uh, the Fed and market expectations. Uh, but what we need to know is, is what's happening with the most traded currency in the world. Um, we've got some very yo-yo markets at the moment. Um, last week, euro dollar looked like it was going to break down several times, only to see the euro buyers coming in to drag it high or the market, as I said, smashing dollar rallies uh, over some data or event. And I think that same theme is going to continue. Um, I'm starting to feel a bit more bearish on this pair, which is probably music to your ears uh, at the moment. Um, and that, that's, <laughs> that's even while I'm still long down for at, uh, from 105s. Um, the technical picture speaks for itself. It, you know, despite not really breaking to any new areas, we have been in a downtrend since that late 2023 rally uh, that faded in the beginning part of this year. And that downward trend is uh, it's set to continue while the market plays the guessing games with the ECB and still feels like the ECB is wrong. 
uh, and will either cut before the Fed or have to cut more than the Fed. I still think the market is very wrong on that, um, but I can't ignore the price action um, and even this downtrend. But I don't see any real reason for a massive break lower, bar any shock or, or risk event or a big change in the data uh, diverging between the US and, and Europe. But I think that rallies are something to watch for a potential fade trade. Uh, that's what I'll be looking at this week, particularly if we get a hot CPI report uh, that sends you, you know, euro dollar up back through, say, 109 or something like that. Um, for the longer term, we're still holding the uptrend, and that doesn't start to look dodgy until we break the 50 fib of that October rally. Um, if we bounce from there, we might see the trend resume to new highs. So this is a case of trading uh, the short-term situation versus the long-term uh, trend and how one can have opposing strategies but still make money both ways. Yes, indeed. Although I think my views on the euro are probably quite well known at this point. Um, <laughs> what I do think was interesting, though, is actually the the, the action we saw last week. Um, yes, the, the euro was a bit softer after the ECB, um, but it wasn't massively sold into. I mean, that to me just spoke more of folk who were long expecting more aggressive pushback from Lagarde, not getting it and just closing out their positions rather mm -hmm. than, as literally, as you've just said, in terms of, of crude, new participants coming in with, with fresh positions into the market. So, um, yeah, I think the euro is in an interesting spot. Um, but you know, purely for me, when I, I look at euro dollar on a, a fundamental basis, whether it's a rate differential, whether it's a growth differential, an inflation differential, whatever you want to look at, um, there's there's nothing there that makes me want to buy the common currency at the moment. <laughs> nothing at all. Uh, you're not going on holiday or anything uh, this year? Uh, uh, <laughs> you not avoid Europe. Europe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I see where you're coming from. But then, uh, you know, I keep coming back to to. My thought that uh, the Fed is still, you know, 120, 140 basis points higher rates than the ECB. So, hmm. you know, that, that means ECB can take a little bit longer and they may not need to be in such a rush or cut as much as uh, the Fed might need to to get down to those neutral areas. I, I still think that's something that the market doesn't pick up on the, too often. No, that's a, a very good point. And, um, you know, you, you are uh, right to make it. Uh, go on. I'll, I'll ask you this question then. Um, you know, euro dollar spot currently, and it's what, 25 to 3 in the afternoon, uh, 108.05. Let's call it 108. Where do we go next? 111, so three big figures higher, or 105, three big figures lower? What trades next? Uh, uh, I'd say 111. Yeah, I think it's it's going to take a lot to get down I'll to 105. that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a quote big enough to drive a bus through, as you used to say, on the floor. So, uh, yeah. But no, I'm, I'm gonna, I don't need to ask you where, where your number is. Uh, that's obvious. I'm surprised you've gone as high as 105 and not uh, <laughs> sub parity by 0.95 or something like that. <laughs> now, now, let's be realistic. Uh, right. From the most traded currency in the world to what's perhaps become the most boring currency in the world over the last uh, month or so. And that is, of course, cable. Uh, spot has been between 126 and 128 for six, seven weeks now, pretty much since, actually, the December FOMC and BOE meetings. Um, cable has gone absolutely nowhere. And you can see that range being very, very well defined on the chart. We had one very brief foray north of 128 that lasted about half an hour, and one very brief foray south of 126, which lasted an equally short period of time. I think this is interesting, though, because although we haven't really gone anywhere, there has been reason for Sterling to strengthen. The risk sentiment has remained very, very strong. The S&P 500, as we said earlier, at new all-time highs. And we've actually had, besides that uh, December retail sales print, which was shocking, um, some decent UK data. Sentiment seems to have been improving a little bit. The January PMIs that we had last week were surprised significantly um, to the upside. And for me, it's concerning that Sterling has done little more than just tread water on all of that positivity. And it makes me ask the question that if the pound can't rally on that good news, what will make it rally, particularly when you've got what's likely to be a relatively dovish pivot coming up from the BOE and this Goldilocks situation in terms of the economic backdrop in the United States, um, it probably won't surprise viewers to learn that I see risks here as tilted to the downside for the pound. And we are sat right on pretty much the 50-day moving average, which comes in at 126.65. So if we can get a closing break below that, which I would point out we haven't actually made since the middle of November, I think that would flip some control in, in, in favour of the bears. Obviously, 
obviously, we'd also like to see a, a break of the bottom of the recent range at 126 as well. Um, but if we get one or both of those, then uh, I would be looking for cable to perhaps wake up again uh, and start motoring to the downside a little bit more. <laughs> always the bear always the bear um <laughs> only, only on the pound not on everything <laughs> uh, I, I take a different uh, a slightly different uh, opinion of this one yes it's not going up but it's not going down either and um, and that is purely on the, the the weighting if you like between the dollar and the pound you know all the uk us eurozone all in the same situation but the market is more bearish uh, and dovish on the ecb hence why we're seeing euro dollar suffering but again, we've got the BOE pretty much level, same rate levels uh, with the US. So there's no real divergence there. Uh, the BOE may need to be a bit more hawkish uh, in their message because the data and inflation is still sticky. So that's why this isn't going anywhere. It is going to need to see the data turning um, for this to start moving lower. Or we probably are just going to continue to go sideways unless we see the US perhaps pulling ahead, uh, you know, data really taking off. Uh, we've got the ISMs and uh, coming up this week as well, and we'll see the big jobs number. So I think if you're looking at the pound in terms of the fundamentals and where it's moving, and that's why I'm going to talk about euro sterling next, is because it's it's the crosses that you're seeing the pound strength really shining through at the moment, whereas it's just looking neutral purely because the balance is, is right between the US uh, and the UK right now, but it's not versus other countries. So, yeah, I think the data might... I think we might get some a bit of negative data in January, um, just as we came out that retail period uh, that all looked good November uh, and not too bad December. Um, I think that drops off a cliff on the retail side, so that's when maybe we start to get some bad numbers. But uh, aside from that, it's it's all looking good. Um, we're in a range, 126, 128. Wake me up when it breaks, uh, and that's probably the same for trading it as well. Exactly. I'm going to uh, change my cable charts to a feed of paint drying, I think, if uh, this goes them upside down. They're, they're much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in any case, you uh, mentioned you were going to talk about things in the crosses. Why don't you do that? I'm going to do exactly that, mate. Um, and yeah, euro sterling. So here you can see perfectly well that we've had a downtrend. Um, so this is this is showing that UK exceptionalism, as, as we've been talking about, uh, particularly in the data over the eurozone, the market. It's not one you hear a lot, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. But that's what gives us the moves. And uh, we, we know, we're heading back to this uh, big 85 zone. Now, I had a bit of an idea that we a bit of a might get a bit of a perfect storm over the ECB uh, where they might give us a move down to this area if they were a bit dovish. Um, but that wasn't to be. So now we have the, the BOE risk to deal with and we're still pretty close to this level. Um, this level is a bit of a make or break level for, for the main 85, 87 range. It's a range I played down here uh, last from last year and I'm, I'm still long some. Um, the decision for me, is whether to trust the level again for, for maintaining this wide range, 85, 87, or whether we're going to get a break and then bust down to some lower levels, perhaps even as far as uh, the 0.83s. I think we're going to get a, a definitive, uh, oh, easy for me to say, I think we're going to get a definitive answer at this level if it's tested. Um, and I'm happy to go with, with whichever direction the market wants to take it. If that's a bounce, then I'll add to my longs. But if it's a break, I'll be happy to flip to shorts. Um, I'm looking at the, a bit of a zone down here. It's sort of 8480 to 8500 uh, there. So a move under 8480 will, will indicate a break uh, to me. Um, sometimes in trading, you know, we get big levels like this, big multi-year levels mm -hmm. um, where our opinion of the fundamentals and, and the drivers, central banks, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is what the price does at that level. And, and that's the most uncomplicated and basic way one can trade. We've got a big level down here. It will hold or it won't. And so the trade is uh, pretty simple from there. Yes, exactly that. Sometimes uh, simplicity is the best way, and that is often the case in the financial markets. Um, I would actually, this is probably the only place in, in G10FX where I'd actually be bullish um, on the pound, just because I think that the Eurozone, I, I don't think either the UK economy or the Eurozone are going to fare particularly well, um, but I think the UK is going to bear up a little bit better um, than the Eurozone is likely to do. Uh, and actually, if we do get a decent break below 85, uh, I wouldn't mind printing this chart off and posting it to the Financial Times, because I very much doubt that they will cover uh, Sterling's brilliant <laughs> performance in uh, in their newspaper. But there we go. Uh, before I get myself in trouble with some journalists, uh, <laughs> let's get on to our plays of the day.
Right, two equity plays for you this week. Uh, I am over on Wall Street because it's a big week of earnings coming up uh, this week, and eventually Kyriakos will bring my chart up. There we go. Uh, We've obviously got 40% or so of the S&P 500 by market cap reporting. Apple, Amazon, Google, Meta, Microsoft, or Alphabet, I suppose we should call them, really, not Google. Um, It's five of the magnificent seven. I think this is going to be pivotal for risk appetite and also important an index level. Um, Those are all within the top 10 in the NASDAQ 100 and I think in the S&P 500 as well by waiting. Um, We spoke earlier on about how they're going to need top and bottom line beats, but also decent guidance um, in order to uh, really unlock some some decent upside uh, after those reports drop. But I think in any case, I I remain bullish uh, over the medium term, even if we do see um, a little bit of wind come out of equities sales this week, if those earnings were to come in um, a little bit cooler than expected. But where I'm struggling is with the consensus this year, which is that value and small caps are going to outperform. Um, I really can't see that one, to be quite honest with you. I think the big are going to continue to get bigger, particularly um, if uh, momentum in the real economy uh, wanes, as we would expect it to. Um, So actually, I'm looking at a couple of spread trades this week, long the S&P short Russell, long the Nasdaq short Russell. It's something that worked well um, over the last year or two, and I think it's something that is likely to continue to work well over the next uh, six or nine months. The Magnificent Seven in my book remains pretty magnificent. Ryan, you're over in China, I believe. Yeah, I'm over in China. And I hope your trade goes better than the one of the funds we heard about last week who uh, spent last year going long China and short Japanese stocks and uh, ended up having to close their doors. So, uh, yeah, I wish you well for that one. Um, hopefully a better result from there. But, uh, yeah, I'm talking stocks as well. And uh, I'm looking at uh, Chinese stocks. Um, when I look to trade China, I usually trade it through uh, dollar yuan. Um but I'm looking at the, the China 50 because uh, that's the one that's uh, tradable for you guys and girls over at Pepperstone. Um, this one requires certain boxes to be ticked before I think about entering. You know, China's been under the cosh, uh, both on the economic front uh, and the international front. But finally, officials seem to be waking up and taking real notice. Uh, we had the uh, RRR cut last week and talk of further cuts in some of the other rates coming. Um, but what did strike me last week was that there was some maybe geopolitical noises started to happen. One headline inferred that, that China was going to step in and, and try to get Iran to ease off their proxy Houthi attacks. Um, suffice to say that there may be signs that China is going to get serious about getting the economy back on track and improving in relations with the West. Um, it may all come to, to naught for now. China stocks have stopped falling, and that's always a signal for a market that may be about to bottom. But for trading it, um, what I want to see is if we retest near or at those prior lows and we hold those lows. If we do, that would add some conviction to uh, potential bottom forming, meaning that we have potentially stopped going down uh, at the least. And then I'll be thinking about trying along. Failing that, a move and then close or retest hold above sort of 11, 5, 6, 6, uh, as you can see that, that first line on the chart, would also potentially cement the low and signal a bottom as well. So it's early days for this one. It's not something I'll, I'll put the farm on. But my my first thought, when, you, when you're in a downtrending market, you want to see it stop falling. And when it starts to do that, that's when you can have some conviction about trying to uh, go the other way. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm glad you've mentioned uh, that fund, actually. Asia Genesis was the the fund that had to shut down. Um, And I just want to touch on that very briefly. Um, Firstly, I wouldn't touch China with a 10-foot barge pole, personally. But anyway, um, (laughs) the reason I want to touch uh, on that fund that shut down is because I actually think it would be very, very important for, if you are watching this, to go and read the letter that the fund manager of Asia Genesis wrote, because it is actually quite a tough read. Um, He was talking in that letter around how he's lost all confidence as a trader, how his decades of experience, this guy has been around for three or four decades, how that experience, and he said, I've got the quote here, is no longer valid, but is in fact working against me. Um, It's a pretty tough read, I'll be honest, but I think it's important 
important to read it because it just shows how quickly markets can change. And I think it speaks to the importance of being able to adapt to markets as they change and remain nimble and remain agile um, to ensure that whatever trading style it is you have um, continues to work. And, and of course, that you continue to uh, to, to protect your capital um, and also, of course, hopefully grow that. But, but capital preservation, um, of course, the, the number one aim in this game. So Asia Genesis, just Google Asia Genesis shutdown letter. It, it, it should come up. Um, in any case, that does bring us to the end of another show. Thank you very much. As always, to Ryan Littlestone from Forex Flow Live and Forex Analytics for joining me. Uh, thank you also to our producer, Kyriakos, for bringing this together as well as he always does. Uh, all three of us will be back with another episode of The Trade-Off this time next week. It is a very busy week ahead, so I'm sure we'll have plenty to discuss. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed today's show, please drop a like on the video. Leave a comment as well. Let us know uh, your thoughts on what we've discussed, if there's anything you want us to touch on next week and how you're trading the markets more broadly. And uh, we will be back in five days time, hopefully after what is going to be a very volatile and busy week. But in the meantime, thanks again for watching and goodbye for now.